This is Lori Forster, the wine coach, and I'm so excited for this week's show. It's the sipping point, as always, where we explore the recipe for a delicious life. And with me on the other side of the screen and the other side of the country, I have Georgetta Dane, who is the head of the Chloe wine brand, the head winemaker, the woman who brings it all together for this brand. And I'm so excited to have you on the show, Georgetta, to explain your background as a woman in the wine industry who comes from Romania, how you came to be in charge of such an amazing brand in California, and what your idea is for, for such a brand. So thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. I'm uh, very thrilled to um, have this uh, virtual tasting with you. Of, uh, <laughs> exactly. I wish I had the, you know, the same bottles here, but uh, we don't have a bottling line of this facility. However, I have uh, right here in cellar full tanks of uh, all those uh, varietals you are tasting today. So. <laughs> well, we could take some breaks. You could go out and do some uh, <laughs> some tank hits. <laughs> um, so I was reading your story, your bio, and you originally came to this country from Romania, and you studied um, food sciences, not specifically making wine. So how do you get from, from there in Romania to now being in California and being in charge of this really global brand? Because we'll get to that in a moment. All of your varietals, uh, some are from Italy, some are from California. Tell me, tell me your story. All right, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long one, but I'll uh, make it shorter. So, um, in Romania, I was um, I was born on a farm, um, and I'm actually the first generation that made it to college. And every time I travel and I talk about the wines, uh, people ask me. Um, how did you start? Your parents had a winery, you had a vineyard. What made you, you know, become a winemaker? And, um, well, my story is, didn't start like that. <laughs> uh, my parents didn't have a, a, a winery, nothing like that. Actually, they, they, they were poor and uh, we, we lived in the communist um, Romania. And um, by the time I was in uh, high school, they were practically the last years of communism. Um, and it was, the, hun the, the entire country was hungry, was starved. And um, uh, to go and uh, graduate food science was, you know, the best thing one could have done in, the, in those times. It was best, better than becoming a a doctor or a lawyer or um, actually was only one university they had uh, about 100 uh, spots open every year and uh, over 2,000 of the best students from Romania were applying on those 100 spots because what that happened is you had food period and uh, food for your family so that's why I went into food science uh, just to help my family just to provide and uh, because it was so tough to get in there, I didn't make it the first year. I wasn't even close. You imagine over 2,000 um, of the best students applying for 100 spots. And I thought that I was very well prepared and I went confident. I wasn't even close. Mm. So uh, I came back home. I studied. I didn't get one year out of the house. I studied harder. And the next year, finally, I was the 32 of the 100 uh, uh, that was uh, accepted. Nice. Uh, <laughs> well, five years later, I uh, graduated with um, a degree in three branches. It was um, meat and products, fermentation, and uh, sugar and products. And um, I was offered two jobs, right? Uh, uh, one of the job was to work in a meat factory, what was practically also a slaughterhouse, and the other was to become a winemaker. Now, of course, my parents were, <laughs> that's no brainer. <laughs> Me. No brainer. But because it was a slaughterhouse and I interviewed and I got to see it, I, I, when I got out of there, I said, no, that's not for me. I cannot work in a slaughterhouse. I cannot see that. I, I would die a little every day. 
So um, I pick the other job. No, you. I so I. It's not like I knew exactly the, how passionate I'm going to be about wine at that point, right? I just uh, I picked uh, becoming a winemaker because um, the other job I was offered, and you couldn't be picky uh, <laughs> at that time. I mean, jobs are so hard to find. It was a miracle, really, that I I was offered to jobs immediately after graduation. So pretty much that's how I started. That's how I became a, a winemaker. By how do you say by default? <laughs> yeah. And eventually you made it uh, to California and you worked with the um, Kendall Jackson Group, Jackson Family Wine Estates. Yes. Before now, doing quite a few years in south of the country where we had a lot of vineyards and we're making the big volumes of. Um, um, dry uh, red and dry white. It was some Chardonnay, it was some Pinot Noir. That's how I started. I also worked with some um, you know, uh, other uh, native varietals like Fetasca Alba. Um, those are uh, Romanian uh, grapes. Nice. And uh, uh, in 1998, uh, my husband was. Uh, just partying with some friends, and one of them had this form to apply for visa lottery for the United States. It was four of the guys, uh, you know, having beers, and they said, hey, <laughs> make a few copies, let's all, all apply, let's all apply, that's fun. So uh, they applied, uh, forgot completely about this, uh, what happened that night. Now imagine my surprise about eight months later, we received from United States Embassy a big, you know, appears a big yellow envelope that says, uh, I open it and it says, uh, congratulations, you won the visa lottery for United States. Wow. So I'm, I'm like, how, how is that even possible? The mother, you know, ask my husband, do you know anything about this? And he's like, yeah, I might know something. I, might, I think I remember something. And <laughs> that's why I happened. And that was wonderful, but you know, there were pros and cons uh, in that moment. We both had jobs. Uh, we are building a new house. Uh, we just, our daughter was two months old. We actually were baptizing her in the very same day when we received the, the envelope from the uh, United States. You know, must have been her luck. Who knows? Wow. That's amazing. Now, my husband was on, also the only child, and his parents were devastated at the thought that he's going to, I do still have a brother, so at least uh, someone, you know, are, is there to take care of my parents. Now, now, on the downside, neither one of us was speaking one word in English. Um, we didn't know anyone in the United States. We had, so... Um, yeah, after a lot of discussion, what should we do? We said, you know, this came with like a strike of luck. We probably would regret our the rest of our lives if we said no to this. Uh, let's give it a try. Let's uh, let's go and we'll see. And so we took two suitcases, our little door, and we landed here in Monterey because some friend, knew a friend, he said, gave us the phone number and said, go 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 see what the guy maybe he can show you around, teach you a few things, you know. Wow. So we landed in Monterey where um, Kendall Jackson was building a brand new winery right here across the street where I work right now. And they hired full crew. They needed people for a cellar, for a lab. For, uh, and that's how both my husband and I uh, got hired. Now, we started real on the bottom because our English was um, non-existent, <laughs> but improved within, within months. We both learned so um, intense, you know, to, right. to be able to communicate and show that we know uh, winemaking and we know chemistry and we know uh, physics and we know math and everything, you know, we just cannot talk really. How so great. In English. So um, within one year, my husband became an assistant winemaker with Kendall Jackson and he worked, I think, six more years for them. And in one year, I moved, I started working in lab, laboratory in Kendall Jackson, and then I uh, switched my jobs right here, where I am today. I started with Golden State Vintners in 2004 uh, with the wine group. So, um, wow. I went through lab, assistant winemaker, winemaker, I'm a senior winemaker today, and I, I, I've been making wine for tw over 20 years. You don't mess around. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but, uh, it was a lot of hard work, but I met wonderful people, uh, people that mentor me along the way, that believed, and uh, it was a beautiful ride. We, it was a great learning experience. So let's some... talk about Chloe, uh, your brand, and I'm, I'm holding up the label here. People can see uh, the bottle. It has a lovely bow uh, right around it. Um, tell me a little bit about your inspiration for the name and the bottle design. Uh, I'm not sure if this is purposely meant to look feminine, but certainly I would think you know that women would be attracted to this packaging for sure. Um, tell me about your vision for the brand and, and all that goes with Chloe. We launched the brand about three years ago. And um, when we created Chloe, it was winemaking, marketing, uh, discussing, and... Um, uh, marketing asked me, you know, let, let, let's start with the basic questions. Why people drink wine? So I said, people drink wine to celebrate, to capture beautiful moments, to create memories. And they say, well, how do you envision a wine for celebration? A, the perfect wine to celebrate. And I thought it has to be classy. It has to be timeless. So... Uh, first, I would use classic varietals. So I would use Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, uh, Pinot Grigio varietals that are, uh, you know, timeless. They are classic. And second, you need the best grapes to make the best wines, we all know. So that's why for Chloe, I went to the source where the best grapes are for that particular varietal. The Pinot Grigio that you show is uh, made with the grapes from Italy, from Valdarige. Then we have a Chardonnay uh, made uh, from grapes from Sonoma County, Russian River Valley. Pinot Noir grapes from Monterey and just a touch of Russian River. Uh, Prosecco obviously can only be from Italy. The red blend is made with grace from some of the most preeminent uh, uh, vineyards from north coast of California, Sonoma Va Valley, Napa Valley, Alexander Valley, Lake County, Mendocino County. <coughs> so I went to the source where I could find the best grapes uh, to make uh, a beautiful wine. Um, the label actually always is uh, supposed to prepare the consumer for the experience that is going to follow, to echo what he's going to find in the bottle. So um, when we thought of timeless and classic, um, the aesthetics of the brand, we tried to, to mirror the iconic beauties of our times, Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Jackie Onassis. That's why we came with a beautiful white label just with a black ribbon. So, I love it. <clears throat> the name Chloe comes from um, Greek and it means blooming. Uh, as winemaker I see it that I have those exceptional grapes and I make them bloom into beautiful wines with the great flavor. So it's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, Chloe, it was in the last 10 years one of the most popular uh, girl, girl's name in the United States, and that helps. Ah. <laughs> I travel and I pour wine. <coughs> you know, people are, oh, that's my door name. Or, uh, oh. I can get, that's my dog name. So, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. That's interesting. Okay relate to the brand, uh, with the brand easily and that is uh, what uh, what we wanted we wanted to create a, a brand that is feminine but also we wanted to be bold and confident we wanted to pop on the shelf to look actually more expensive than it is right and help a consumer relate uh, easily with the brand. well well let's talk about it. let's go to the first one you mentioned the pinot grigio and i happen to have some right here um so tell me a little bit about, uh, this comes from the Trentino region in Italy, uh, Pinot Grigio. Trent, uh, so tell me about the wine, uh, this Pinot Grigio, and the price the price point too, so people have an idea if they're looking to, to find it. The entire uh, line is priced at the same. It is um, $16.99. Yeah, $16.99. 
uh, every single bottle of wine. So the Pinot Grigio that you are tasting is made with the grapes from Val d'Adige. That is, is northeast of Italy. And as you start smelling first, you'll notice that the nose of the wine is, is fresh, it's vibrant. And once you taste the wine, uh, you will feel, you'll taste all those flavors of um, apples, of, uh, <coughs> sorry, honeysuckle, uh, ripe melon, and what I love the most, I always get that uh, marrow lemon flavor. Mm. The, the Pinot Grigio was fermented all in tanks and at low temperature to, to keep that uh, racy acidity. And uh, it's just uh, 12, about 12.5 uh, alcohol, which makes it friendly and easy, you know, to go to the, the second glass, have a second glass. Yes, I, it's nice and crisp, mouth-watering. You want uh, seafood. I live here in Maryland on the East Coast, and uh, seafood is everywhere <laughs> around us. This is a perfect seafood wine, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a elegant Pinot Grigio and very flavorful. Yeah. Yes. One of the Pinot Grigios that, uh, you know, you, you should ex expect, um, uh, expect from it. Yeah, wonderful. So... From an Italian Pinot Grigio, um, the next one I chose, because rosé is such a popular category right now, and everybody seems to be, you know, it took us a while in America to catch on to dry rosé, but everybody seems to be drinking it now. Um, we just recently did a show about the wines of Provence, France, and they're known for their rosé. But you've got a lovely rosé here from Monterey, uh, made from Pinot Noir. Tell me a little bit about your... Chloe rosé. I made uh, that rosé um, using two methods. So you can make a rosé just taking pin Pinot Noir straight to press, squeeze it, and then ferment it as a white wine. Mm -hmm. Or you can take the Pinot Noir and start like uh, the winemaking for a red wine and do a sanier or um, bleeding in English. Yeah. So uh, what that does is keeping it on the skins a few more days, and um, that makes a very flavorful rosé. However, it, it, with those flavors, that's the good part. The bad part is you get color because uh, of the too long, uh, few days skin contact. So that's why I played with both, like a 50-50, so I come straight to the press uh, that didn't have so much color. Uh, some, uh, I did a sanier which gave me wonderful flavors and uh, together came to that beautiful rosé color that I call it the ballet slippers. Oh, beautiful. Pink ballet slipper color. Yeah. Um, then, then it was all uh, fermented with um, uh, low temperatures, long period of time, about uh, a month. And uh, the flavors are all strawberries and raspberries and watermelon. Yeah, and, it's delicious. Uh, it's one of my favorites, especially now that uh, outside they are almost, uh, you know, 90 degrees. Uh, that's where I go to my rosé and the Pinot Grigio. <laughs> Prosecco. Prosecco is not bad. <laughs> yes, Prosecco is, uh, so, so how do you manage the, so the Pinot Grigio and your Prosecco, which, Prosecco is just like going crazy in the United States as well. Um, how do you manage that, those grapes being grown in a totally different country than where you're based? Um, and that production, are you, how are you managing that from California? Well, uh, is um, first, they know what they do, so they know <laughs> they visit uh, uh, how, how to make Prosecco or what our... Um, or mine, uh, uh, in, where I intervene is uh, where to pick the grapes, where, where the grapes come from. So this, uh, we have about um, 10 small growers that owe uh, about 60 acres between uh, Valdo Viadene and Conigliano. Yep. And they provide for us some of the best Glera grapes. Um, Everything is picked by hand because it's so hilly and cannot be done uh, by machines. And uh, those grapes are picked the second part of September and uh, they go to the winery where uh, through, through the first fermentation. 
And um, the second fermentation, uh, which is done uh, uh, in autoclaves or uh, pressurized tanks, right. it's happening about uh, longer than a month. It, it can go all the way to three months, but I like to do it longer and I insist on that because that's what makes a good Prosecco. The longer uh, the fermentation, the smaller the bubbles, the higher the quality of the Prosecco. Nice. So that, that's one thing. Um, that uh, I made sure. The second, uh, most of the Proseccos on the market right now are kind of sweet. They uh, have about 25 grams per liter residual sugar. For Chloe Prosecco, it's only 15. So I reduce the residual sugar to make it feel more refreshing, more alive, more uh, perfect for uh, hot summer days. Absolutely. And I love that you say that. Uh, I was reading an article about Prosecco in the U.S., and, uh, you know, it is so popular, but I think one of the challenges that they talked about in the article is that now people think, well, anything that says Prosecco is great. And, uh, you know, just as long as you see that word, you're fine. But there is a, such a difference between producers and the different quality levels of Prosecco that one is not exactly like the other. Some are sweeter, some are drier. Uh, there, there is a difference. And it, the, it, it mirrors where the grapes are, the quality of the grapes, the extent of fermentation. So there, there are many things that can make uh, Prosecco on uh, different levels of quality, of course. I think it's a secret weapon, though, at any party, because even a diehard beer drinker seems to love Prosecco. So <laughs> it definitely is something you need a case of in your house at all times, I believe. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the rosé is lovely. Uh, I love the ballet slippers term. I'm going to remember that one when I when I tell people about your your rosé from Monterey. So uh, I told you um, one of the shows that I am obsessed with on Showtime is called Billions, and it's about this um, hedge fund manager Axelrod, and he is just a ruthless businessman. But one night when I was watching the show, I happened to see the Chloe Red Blend on the counter, and they were uh, enjoying, enjoying it on the show. So, so your wines have gone Hollywood now, too. How does that feel? <laughs> well, that makes me very happy. <laughs> my, my girl made it to Hollywood, I mean. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Okay, so tell me a little bit about, this is a North Coast Red Blend. Um, we mentioned the Pinot Noir, which is from Monterey, uh, Appalachian, um, and, but this is the other red. So tell me about the red blend, another category that's so hot right now for, for wine consumers. Um, not that red blends are, are a new thing in the world, but for some reason for Americans, they seem, they seem new and exciting. So tell me a little bit about your blend. Um, Chloe 249. First, I uh, name it Chloe 249 because I tasted 249 barrels of uh, wine to come up with a, with a blend, with a formula. It, uh, it took that many until uh, I was like, okay, now I'm happy. This <laughs> Anything tastes good at that point. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it's a blend of uh, Petit Syrah, Syrah, Petit Verdot, Merlot, and Zinfandel. Uh, grapes uh, have been a source, as I said, from Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino County, Lake County, and the Zimpandel is from Lodai. <coughs> now, as you said, there are plenty of uh, uh, red blends right there. Um, and I, I understand why, because blends can make some of the most uh, wonderful and interesting uh, uh, wines in the world. Is the reason I like, you know, blending wines because every time you blend varietals together, it's like each one brings something to the party. You have, you know, you, you get blueberries from the Petit Syrah. You get cherries, cranberries from, uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, Merlot. Um, so Zinfandel brings spice. And many years ago, <laughs> when I started making wine, geez, it's... <laughs> Many. So I had to, um, to come with a, how to say, with a plan, with a plan. How, how you blend wines, you know, to, to get to, to that point where, where you are happy and you say, yeah, 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 this is it. <laughs> then it happened that I was, uh, I was studying about perfumes, which 
uh, are uh, some, you know, I like perfumes too. I'm not allowed to, to wear them as a winemaker, but I love perfumes. I was, I was reading about perfumes and I found out that uh, in uh, the way they blend essential oils when, uh, when they create a perfume, they, they make a base and they add middle notes and top notes. And I, <clears throat> well, when I have so many varietals and each one has some flavor that is uh, predominant, it's like practically I have essential oils. So how about if I try that? And that became my philosophy as blending as a winemaker. So for this particular blend, <coughs> right, I have my base. I pick the, the bigger, the bold, the muscular varietals, and that's Petit Syrah, Syrah, Petit Verdot. These are all big wines, and they created my skeleton for, for the wine, the support. And then the next middle notes, I pick the Merlot which is lighter and a little flirtier, and that puts, how, how you say, the meat on the bones. Mm -hmm. Then my top note was the Zinfandel, which is spicy. <laughs> you know, in a perfume, the top note is supposed to, um, you smell it first, but it's not supposed to last. So it's the same with the Zinfandel. It's just to give the impression, yeah. but actually what, uh, what you really taste then, uh, is the base. Yeah, lovely. Wonderful. And... Uh, is, is this your, was the Chloe Red uh, number 249, is this your first blending wine that you've created from a blend or? Oh, no, no, no. I've been making blends for many, many years. And every time, even when I make a Chardonnay, I'm still looking for the same. So let's say you make a Chardonnay, but I only have Chardonnay, so I, I cannot put anything else in. Still, I have one Chardonnay that uh, was fermented in barrels. Mm. I have another Chardonnay that was fermented all in cans. I have a Chardonnay that went through malolactic fermentation, which makes it taste and feel buttery and creamy, like you have popcorn. So that's right. why I layer. I like to layer, make layers. So really, any wine can be a blend, you're right, um, because of different lots and different ways that you're aging or with lees. Different appellations, different terroirs, I mean, Chardonnay from Santa Barbara or Chardonnay Monterey or Chardonnay Sonoma, they're all different. The terroir is so important. They taste different. Some are mineral, some are uh, tropical. So, so to me as a winemaker, I'm exactly like a kid in a candy store. And you, you have all these things. Uh, you're like a mad scientist with all these uh, experiments going. Exactly. I, uh, that, that's my honestly favorite part of the wine. I love it all because it's... It's much science <coughs> from the moment when we pick the grapes, you know, then we start adding yeast and nutrients and it's fermentation and it's temperature and it's some math we have to do. It. But when it comes to blending, that's when you are the artist, you know, and I, I love that now. Now I know that I picked the perfect job back then when I offered, you know, those two. I didn't know at that point. I really didn't. But... Uh, being a winemaker, you know, gave me gave me chance to be a scientist, what I studied, but also to be an artist, and that's what kept me happy and in business for uh, over two decades. I love it. I love it. Well, you are just amazing to talk to, and all of these wines are so beautiful in their own different ways. I'm so excited to try the Prosecco and the Pinot Noir as well, because I would expect them to be just as good. Um, so... I always ask this question, so this will be interesting to get your perspective with such a great international background. What's the first wine you ever tried? The first wine I ever tried. Okay, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it was in Romania, and uh, uh, well, we don't have the 21 years old uh, limit, you know, to drink, so my parents never... Um, uh, never made a rule in the house that children are not allowed to try if they were curious about wine. Nice. And they say, oh, go ahead. So I remember being uh, probably high school and the first uh, <laughs> wine I tried was uh, rosé. Very flavorful, a little sweet at that point. Yeah, I like them sweet because that's how people, um, that's entry level. That's how people get into wine, like to enjoy. They start a little sweet. Then they moved into then serious whites, right. 
and the next would be uh, serious reds and uh, because those are tannic and really tough to, to start with big reds with the petit syrup and like right. so as a child adolescent uh, yeah that it was a rosé and it was sweet very sweet yeah and then a lot of us started that way so that's similar but i know in europe people get to uh taste wine a lot sooner than uh, <laughs> than we did here so that that's nice that it's more part of the the meal process although that's totally changed in this country over the last 20 years you've probably seen a big change yes in wine culture in the united states uh since the time you've been here i would assume uh, you can imagine with both my husband and myself being winemakers my daughter seen us drinking like every day so I didn't want her to think that wrong <laughs> with us, you know. And wine everywhere in my house, there is wine everywhere. I right? agree. So yeah, we we had the discussion. You know, <laughs> that wine is actually a food, and it's meant to be enjoyed with dinner or with lunch along your food, and it's not something that you drink to get high. Period. So if she. She never expects us ever to see that, you know, to see that in my house. So we always have one, two glasses uh, with dinner, and uh, she's oh, she can try, you know, she yeah. she she can try absolutely. Sometimes I even um, I ask her opinion. Oh, and wonderful! Maybe a wedding winemaker. I, I knew that was going to follow. No, no, she doesn't. Right. <laughs> now she's, uh, she's in pre-med. She's a student at UC San Diego. So, no, no more winemakers, unfortunately. Probably if uh, I had a boy, well, things might have been different. <laughs> I love it. Well, Georgetta, uh, thank you so much for your time. If folks want to check it out, I have here, it's chloewinecollection.com, and they can see everything about all of your uh, wines across the line. I love that they're all priced under $20, so very affordable, very everyday possible, which is wonderful. And um, it's so great to see a woman who in such a short period of time in this country has uh, made such a huge uh, stake in the, in the wine business. So congratulations to you. And I'm so excited to, uh, to have had this time with you. Anything you want to leave the listeners with or um, invite them to do? Uh, first, thank you so much. Oh, of uh, course. Wonderful, uh, you know, talking with you. And for my um, wine lovers there, uh, what can I say? Just uh, as uh, our tagline is, capture your beautiful moments. And... Uh, Toast with the Chloe wines. I love it. All right. So, yeah, everybody capture your beautiful moments and, um, you know, hashtag or tag at the wine coach or at Chloe wines. And I'd love to see everyone out there enjoying their wine and what they're doing. Uh, I understand you have a little trip coming up. Why don't you let us live vicariously for you? Where, where are you headed? Ah, you're asking me? Yes. <laughs> I'll be living in two days in Costa Rica. Oh, wonderful. And you got a couple of weeks, right? Two weeks, yeah, family yeah. vacation in Costa Rica. I can't wait. It's my first time, so I'm so ready. I'm so ready for the water and the sun. Wow. Well, cheers to your holiday, uh, Georgetta, Georgetta, and all the time. And to Chloe Wines, thank you for being on The Sipping Point. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.